Hi, Year 5. Hope you're all well. Hope you're all staying safe during lockdown. Um, this is my first attempt at putting together a video lesson. Um, it's several clips bolted together. Um, it does last for about 20 minutes, but don't be too put off by that because that isn't 20 minutes of me speaking at you. There's a, a film clip in there, there's a story in there, and it won't feel like me droning on at you for, for 20 minutes. Um, the aim of this lesson is for you to produce a piece of writing for me. Um, both classes, both year five classes, preferably on your class blog. Um, I want this piece of writing to have a particular focus. I want you to focus on writing for suspense. Um, as you go through this lesson, you'll find it's in, in four parts. There's this introduction from me, and then a bit of an introduction with some slides. Then I'm gonna read you a story. Uh, then I'm going to show you a, uh, an animated clip and then we'll go through some uh, features of writing for suspense. Okay, so as I've said, I want you to write a piece of writing that contains some suspense, that focuses on a situation that has some suspense. I thought the best place to start with what suspense is, is getting a definition of suspense. So suspense, it's a state or feeling of excited or anxious uncertainty about what may happen. So excited, anxious, uncertainty. They're the three main things that I want to feel when I read your writing. I want to be excited. I want there to be some action. I want there to be some threat or some peril which will make me feel anxious, anxious about the main character, anxious about what's gonna to happen to the main character. I want the main character or protagonist that is going to feel anxious about what is happening. And obviously there'll be some uncertainty. So when I say uncertainty, that means I don't want you to reveal what is causing the anxiety. Not straight away anyway, you can build up to that. Anxiety, suspense, the they're sort of similar to being scared, but it's not quite the same. I don't want to be frightened. I don't want you to shout boo at me and make me frightened in that way. It's got to be a gradual build up. Sometimes it's better not to say something than to say something. Maybe leave me guessing, maybe leave me in the dark about what the threat is. Okay, the build up, the waiting, the imagining of where you're going to take me as a reader is much more suspenseful than actually revealing what the big shock is straight away. Build up to it. Leave me hanging. And of course, hanging is another definition of the word suspense or suspend. If we suspend something, we hang it up. So that leads us on to how do we actually create the tension? Well, towards the end of this lesson, we'll discuss a list of features that you can pick from that might well create tension or suspense in your writing um, like a list of success criteria we've used marking ladders before that sort of thing i'm not actually going to give you a marking ladder as such but there will be plenty of features on the screen for you to have a look at um, before you write um, the next step is i'm going to read you a short story which has an element of suspense in it it also has a resolution in it, this one, so that eventually takes the suspense and the tension away. Uh, and you'll be able to follow that on the screen because the text will be up as well. Once I've read that, I'll discuss with you some of the ways that the author conveys suspense in that story. So I'm suggesting that if, you, if you're watching this um, and watching me read the story, listening to me read the story, uh, you'll probably want to make some notes as we go along. The Nightmare Man by Pi Corbett. Sally was afraid. At school, they called her the Freddy Girl because she seemed afraid of everything. But what she feared the most was the darkness. Every night, she didn't want to go upstairs to bed. She hung around in the kitchen making excuses. Anything to delay going up the stairs. Anything to delay the moment when the light was switched off, plunging her room into darkness. One moment the room was bright, the next split second and the room was darker than jet. 
As her eyes adjusted, vague shapes swam into view. The chair in the corner looked like an old man crouching down, ready to leap at her. The dressing gown on the back of the door was like a thin man, leaning, waiting for her to sleep before he hobbled across the room towards her. Sally lay in the darkness, every night watching the old man and the thin man. Neither of them ever moved, but she was sure that when she fell asleep they would be up and wandering round, peering at her sleeping face. But more than anything, she feared the nightmare man. Sally had seen him once, watching her through the window, a tall, dark shape with a cloak billowing out behind him and two red eyes that glowed. She'd spent the rest of the night buried under the covers, waiting for dawn. Of course, she'd told her mother, but all she ever said was, don't be so silly, or hurry up and eat your breakfast, or not now, we'll be late for school. Since that night, Sally made sure that her curtains were pulled tightly together. The night of the storm, Sally lay in her bed watching the old man and the thin man. Thunder grumbled in the distance, lightning crackled, rain lashed the street. Surely the nightmare man wouldn't be out on a night like this. Sally just had to know. Heart thudding, she crept from her bed and peeked through the curtains. She got the shock of her life because there he was, clinging to the window with his twin red eyes staring right at her. Sally stepped back, but at that very moment the lightning flashed, lighting up the night sky. The nightmare man had gone, but Sally could see a distant tower, a tower with two red lights. She also saw the tree by her window move in the wind, casting a dark shadow. In that moment, as the lightning lit up the night, she realised that the Nightmare Man had not really existed at all. Only in her mind. She laughed out loud. Her bed seemed warm and cosy. She stared across the, her room, through the curtains at the distant lights of the tower, and watched the tree's shadow blowing in the wind. After that, the Nightmare Man never came back. Soon, the Thin Man became a dressing gown, and the old man was just a chair with her clothes draped across it, ready for the next morning, ready for the sunlight. So that was The Nightmare Man by Pi Corbett. Um, perhaps not the most suspenseful or scary story you'll ever read, but maybe the suspense comes from the fact that it's a sort of everyday story. Maybe we've, most of us, experienced some sort of fear or uncertainty when that light gets turned off in our bedroom and things become strange shapes rather than the sort of familiar objects that, that we know that they are. And of course there's an element as well of uh, facing fears in the story and then a resolution at the end. <clears throat> the The story is, is about a fear of the unknown and the character's imagination running wild and the potential threat of things that really aren't threatening. Um, nobody's really ever been threatened or scared by a dressing gown but when it becomes something else in the darkness then the threat and the um, anxiety is built. I want you to think about Sally's fear. Her, her fear was of ordinary objects that were out to get her. The chair with the clothes on, the dressing gown were two strange people in her room. Do you think that that's more suspenseful um, than actually having real characters that the char that the main character is is afraid of these everyday objects that turn into something else of course the location of the fear is a big deal here as well the fear was in her room at night now suspense definitely in writing occurs frequently at night um but also the settings are very personal setting your bedroom is your own personal space so having that personal space invaded by a potential threat makes it all the more scary, all the more suspenseful. We need to look at the short sentences as well describing the storm. When the tension's being built up, those sentences do become a little bit shorter. And also to contrast the actual fear that she was feeling and the dismissive nature of her mother's com comments, the contrast between her brushing it off and Sally's actual fear makes Sally's fear seem all the stronger um quick comment on the storm as well quite often a storm um will appear in things like ghost stories and suspense stories as well um again as i said earlier we'll get on to features of suspense stories later on okay we're going to move it on now and i uh, think this is more suspenseful more edge of the seat stuff um and it's it's a 
video clip um, of a story about a girl called Frances Brandywine. Um, definitely elements of suspense in this. Definitely has that edge of the seat quality. Um, as you can see in bright yellow, I don't think it's suitable for younger children, so don't be showing it to any younger brothers or sisters. Indeed, you might want to watch it with an adult around. It's about seven minutes long, so stick with it. Um, and I want you to make notes about how you feel during different parts of the story. What emotions are you experiencing? What feelings do you have? Um, I also, side by side with that, want you to make a note of the feelings and the emotions felt by Francis, the main character, as the story unfolds. Also, pay attention to the narrator and the changes of pace and sentence length as the suspense gets built up. When I was a kid in the suburbs of Chicago, adventure meant Quetico Provincial Park, up on the border of Minnesota and Canada. The name implies the place was small, but Quetico is a million acre nature preserve, so big you could go days and days without seeing another soul. We would go on camping trips up there, weeks of canoeing and portaging, seeing bears and moose and deer, sleeping under star-soaked skies. The park was isolated and so pristine, you could actually drink the water straight from the lakes. But I won't be going back to Quetico anytime soon. Not after what happened to a girl named Frances Brandywine. Frances was 17 at the time, black haired and with a reckless nature, determined always to leave the well-trod path, to break new ground and be alone. A few years ago, Frances was up in Quetico with her family. They were in a remote part of the park, camped on the shore of one of the deeper lakes, a lonely body of water carved millions of years ago by a passing glacier. The deep part of this particular lake was rumored to be about 300 feet. One night after her family went to bed, Frances took the rowboat out, planning to find a quiet spot in the middle of the lake lay on the bench of the boat, look up at the sky, and maybe write in her journal. So she left the shore, rode for about 20 minutes, and when she felt satisfied that she was over the lake's deepest spot, she lay down on the bench and looked up at the night sky. The stars were very bright, and the aurora borealis was shimmering like a neon lasso. She was feeling very peaceful. Then she heard something strange. It was like a knock. She sat up, guessing that the boat had drifted to shore and run aground. But she looked around the boat and she was still a half a mile from shore. She leaned over the side to see if she'd hit anything, but she saw nothing. No log, no rocks. She lay back down. She told herself it could be any number of things, a fish, a turtle, a stick that had drifted under the boat. She relaxed again and soon fell into a contented reverie. She had just closed her eyes when she heard another knock. This time it was louder, a crisp, like the sound of someone knocking hard on a wooden door. Except this knocking was coming from the bottom of the boat. Now she was scared. She leaned over the side again. It had to be an animal. But what kind of animal would knock like that? Three quick, loud knocks in rapid succession? Her mouth went dry. She held onto each side of the boat, and now she could only wait to see if it happened again. The silence stretched out. A few minutes passed, and just as she began to think she'd imagined it all, the knocks came again, but this time louder. She had to leave. She lunged for the oars. She got them in place and began rowing. The water was very calm, so she should have made quick progress. But after rowing feverishly, she looked around and she realized that she wasn't moving at all. Something was keeping her exactly where she was. Again, she tried rowing. She rowed and rowed on the verge of tears, but she went nowhere. She stopped. She was exhausted. 
Her heavy breathing filled the air. She cried, she sobbed. But soon she calmed herself again, and the boat was silent again for 10 minutes. And 20. Again, she tricked herself into thinking she'd imagined it all. But just like before, just when she was beginning to get a grip on herself, the knocking came again, this time as loud as a bass drum. The floorboards of the boat shook with each knock. Now she was so shaken, she started making questionable decisions. The first was to lower one of the oars into the black water, trying to feel if there was some land mass, even some creature she could touch. As soon as the oar broke the water surface, though, she felt a strong, silent tug at the other end, and the oar was pulled under. She screamed, she jumped back, and now she had no options. All she could do was sit and hope and wait. Wait for the morning to come. Wait for whatever was going to happen to happen. The knocking went on through the night. She passed the time writing in her notebook. And it's only because of this notebook that we know what happened that night. Francis can't tell us. She was never seen again. The boat was found on shore the next day, empty but for the journal. On those pages were her frantic jottings, all written in her distinctive handwriting, all but the last page. When the journal was found, that page was still wet, and on it were four words, looking as if they'd been written quickly with a muddy finger. They said, I did knock first. enjoyed that clip i hope it it had you on the edge of your seat and i hope you saw the elements of suspense within it um one of the things that i will say is we don't have the advantage of having uh incidental music and crashes and sounds that we can add to things to make the reader jump a little bit um so we've got to be uh, a bit more creative with our writing one of the things that is definitely in that clip is a variety of sentence lengths Often short sentences are used to build pace and tension. And if you listen to the narrator, he often uses short sentences to convey that tension. Two or three word sentences in some cases. Again, the action uh, is involving a lone character. Uh, we also use the word protagonist to describe a character. Again, it takes place at night. And again, it's the fear of the unknown. It's something mysterious, just like the nightmare man was before Sally discovered what he really was. Again, similar to um, the Nightmare Man story, there are contrasts in the action between the tense bits and calmer moments. Um, the action builds gradually to a, to a climax, to a crescendo, and repetition is used to build tension as well. For example, the knocking on the boat happens on three occasions. So as I said earlier, we are finishing this presentation off with features that I want you to focus on. So the main one is fear of the unknown. Um, I don't want it to be too obvious what the fear is. I want there to be an element of not knowing what it is. So Sally in her story didn't know what would, what the nightmare man was. Francis in her story didn't know what was co causing the knocking. 
I want you to think about the setting for your story. Remote settings are good, isolation's good, but the Sally story, the Nightmare Man, showed that fear occurring in a familiar place can also be uh, suspenseful as well. Nighttime, quite often a cliche, but quite often um, used for suspense and things like storms as well. Um, I think it'd probably be easier to concentrate on just a single main character. I want you to gradually build the atmosphere, perhaps by repetition, as we discussed the repetition, uh, the knocking in the Francis story. Uh, short sentences are good for building up that feeling of, of suspense and tension. And I want you to contrast calm moments with tense mo moments. Quiet and loud, slow and fast, they all help. Finally, Think about the main character. Think about their feelings and emotions. Heightened senses. Great opportunity to describe those heightened senses. And that in turn, I think, will help with uh, engaging a reader and making sure that they are on the edge of their seat too. So finally, um, as well as doing a piece of writing for us, this is a, a way to keep in touch so we can have a conversation about your writing, but also about how you're doing and it keeps you in touch with school and me in touch with you and, and so on. I really want as many people as possible to have a go at this so I can give as many people as possible feedback and we can populate our class blogs with some really good writing. It's a good opportunity to use the blog as well. I know some of you have been using them during lockdown. It'd be nice if we could get some more lengthier pieces of writing up there. Um, and of course, once we've got things on the blog, we can share them with the school and, and a wider audience. Remember, it's for both year five classes. And finally, just to say, enjoy it. Have a good time writing your suspense story.